Russell? So I'll, I think I can answer that question, June. Um, the answer is for this particular meeting, we moved to using Zoom's registration mode for the meeting, right? And this is just the, just the systems change meeting. Um, that's the only one that I helped facilitate. Uh, in terms of like the, the other, um, the, uh, the topic calls, um, I don't know. It didn't look like that it was set up similarly. Uh, however, it might be. Um, are you using, you don't know if you're using a registration link there. I don't think we are, because okay. that would be a major sea change. Yeah, well, we're trying to do it because it's, one, it's more secure, and two, it gives us more information about who's actually here and attending. So you get a printout afterwards or something? Not exactly, but we can go in and see the attendance and pull a report, so. Okay. And we can also email the entire list of attendees oh. information. So that's convenient. Yeah. What time are we starting? We should be starting. Let's give this another um, just one more minute. Let me oh, let okay, so right now. Okay. filter cool. in. Uh, yeah. I'll unmute. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Folks are still coming in, Russell. Yes, I feel that that's going to be the case for just a few minutes. I, I mm -hmm. agree. Again, have a feeling that folks were have been attending um, National Council on Independent Living's uh, annual conference. Yeah. And as a result, we are smack dab in the middle. You are spot on. We're competing with the workshop, so thank you for being here. Give us one more minute and then we'll get started. We'll give this, we'll, let's give this till um, five after, and then we'll get rolling. I just really, um, I wanna make sure that folks are able to come in. Perfect. Uh, say Russell. I put the um, the caption link in the chat box, so we're ready to roll on that when folks, everybody gets here. Great. So yes. thank you, thanks, Shana. This um, the captions, uh, in addition to being available in Zoom, are available via stream text, uh, and the link for that is now in your chat. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Welcome to our monthly disability, uh, disability Disaster Strategies Coalition. And uh, this is our systems change call. This is a secondary piece to the conversation that happens the first or second Thursday of every month at the same time. Um, and I am joined by June, who many of you know, and uh, just gave a presentation at Nickel on uh, a kind of a national picture of the work that we're doing here, um, but it's good to see you. Um, we are also joined by Shana today, who will be assisting us with um, logistics and helping out with um, making sure that every all the Zoom things run smoothly, which 
super helpful and also um, assisting us with capturing any any um, notes or, or actions. So, thank good morning, you. everyone. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, let's um, if we let's take a minute to do some quick uh, introductions. If you don't mind sharing. Um, your name, your pronouns, and what part of the you know organization that, that you're with, or part of the um, state, or in some cases country that you're in, uh, and uh, if you want to share sh a brief update on any work that you're doing, um, we will certainly you know take that at the beginning. But let's um, our big focus today is the uh, the document that I shared and talking about, you know, some updates that we can, we can work on. So let's, let's start with introductions. Again, I'm Russell Rawlings. My pronouns are he and him. I am the statewide community organizer here at CFILC. And I will, just for the purpose of speed, I'll pass to folks. Um, let's go to Jan. Morning, Jan Lamucci. I'm the Long-Term Services and Supports Manager with Independent Living Center of Kern County. I oversee all long-term services and supports issues for older adults, people with disabilities, as well as um, cover the program for public safety power shutoffs for PG&E and SCE. Thank you. Great. Uh, next, let's go to Angie. Hi, uh, my name is Angie Bagnus, and I am the uh, Community Education Coordinator for uh, Access to Independence in San Diego, which is our uh, independent living center. And uh, I do uh, twice monthly emergency preparedness workshops, and I'm uh, helping to coordinate our emergency response with all of our um, county emergency services uh, and trying to make sure that we're all um, connected and communicating and coordinating with each other for uh, preparation for um, any uh, emergencies that might occur here. Thank Great. you. It's good to see you, Angie. Uh, Thank Sid. you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi, y'all. This is Sid. Um, as, you, as you know, it looks like most everyone here is familiar with me, um, but in case folks aren't, um, so I'm the new disability disaster manager with CFILC's DDAR program. Um, I wanted to, uh, my pronouns are she, they, I'm currently out of uh, Oakland, California. Um, and I wanted to take a second, I'm really happy to be here and I'm glad to see many familiar faces. Um, I wanted to take a second to let folks know that um, CFILC and DDAR are, are actually conducting another annual survey. Um, so we are collecting information from consumers with disabilities, of course, um, related to their, their needs before and, and during disasters, as you all are familiar with. Um, we conducted a similar survey in 2019, and the results of that really provided you know, much of the foundation for, to, to sort of illustrate the need for the DDAR program. And so you know, as some time has passed and we wanted to do another round of, of survey this year. And so what I'm gonna do is I will paste the, the link and sort of the survey overview in the chat. And you know, this, is, this is not the official launch day or anything. So, I'm just sort of, we're just kind of like slowly getting the ball rolling on this. Um, and if you all are willing to start to pass this on to consumers, that's fine. We can wait a few days. We're gonna, um, we're gonna be posting some more information on our website and, and doing some more social media outreach. But I just wanted to sort of let you all know that that's, that's something that's coming. So thanks for, <laughs> thanks for listening and uh, for participating. He sent me this to, is there a, any opportunity to impact any of the questions on the survey? Uh, yeah, definitely, June. Please take a look, you know, and uh, of course, we're, we're very much interested in, in your, your feedback, of course, and, you know, nothing set in stone. Um, I think you'll see the survey is pretty robust. 
Um, but yes, definitely, definitely reach out if you if you um, have something you'd like to add. Thanks, Sid. And this is a this is a great call to bring that up on. So um, perhaps as part of our conversation, we can talk a bit about how um, surveys uh, will influence what we're what we're trying to discuss here. So thank you, um, uh, Marquise. Hi, how's everyone doing? Not to correct you, my name is actually Marcus, even though it's Marcus. spelled Marquise. No, that's all right. I'm the Emergency Management Coordinator uh, at Skill. That's the uh, Service Center for Independent Life for the ILC in um, LA County uh, in Claremont. Uh, my job description lines up with, I think, most of the people here. I'm uh, the point person for the DDAR program in our area, or in, in our catchment, and I do disaster presentation with our consumers in a nutshell. So thanks for having me. All right, uh, Megan. Is that Meg Megan Teresi? Oh, um, I, I, I just want to make sure because I know there's a lot of Megans. Um, hi, everybody. I am Megan Geraci with PG&E, and I'm the contract manager for the um, uh, for the CFILC contract with us uh, for the DDAR program. And so I work with Sydney a lot and also with uh, Christina Mills. So just happy to be here and... Um, Hear what uh, what everybody has to say and to um, be able to participate. Thank you. Great, thank you, Megan. And just to verify, you're also your join your phone audio is connected, and your I, video it, is connected through a different uh, separate feed, right? That is correct. Okay. I am um, I am in my garage here, yep. <laughs> so um, I'm going to put myself on. Um, uh, I'll take the video off, but yes, I'm on the phone. I'm the four one five number. That's uh, highlighted right there no worries no worries i was just making sure that maybe there if there was another megan to make sure that we get to to other megan's but thank you megan all right thank you great uh angie oh, i'm sorry there's been yeah. some shuffling Shuffling yeah. on my screen, usually I apologize. I think I already introduced I myself. <laughs> I apologize, Angie. That's okay. Visual shuffling. I'm still here. <laughs> you are still here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bruce. Hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name is Bruce Morgan. I work with Rolling Start. I'm the emergency manager, uh, public safety power shutoff coordinator. Uh, I do uh, multiple uh, trainings online and in person uh, during the month. And uh, I coordinate the battery distribution for San Bernardino, uh, Mono County, and Inyo County. So I'm also doing some trainings of, of people in those counties as well. So that's what I do. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Carolyn. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Carolyn Nava. I am with the Disability Action Center. We're covering eight Northern California counties with the DDAR program. And I am the South County lead. My apology, our group is tied up in another meeting today and I have to leave shortly myself, but we did definitely wanted to introduce and at least let the group know who we are and what county service area we're covering up here. That's great to meet you. Alexandra. I'm Alexandra Enders. I'm in uh, Missoula, Montana. I've been doing emergency management issues for a long time. I used to work in, in independent living in California years ago. I'm very intrigued by the work you're doing, especially around the power batteries, uh, et cetera. So thank you for letting me join. Thanks. Welcome. Lauren. Hi, my name is Lauren Utterback from the Independent Living Resource Center. I'm the Emergency Preparedness Services Manager here, and I do similar DDAR work um, as everyone else um, on this call does. Thank you. Gary. Good morning, everyone. This is Carrie Madden. 
I'm a systems change advocate at CalLife in downtown LA. My pronouns are she and hers. And um, really, I've been wanting to get on this call for a, quite a long time, but my schedule wouldn't allow it. I um, handle um, the FEMA calls. Um, I know our center has been active in emergency planning. Um, we actually sued the city of Los Angeles to be included into in their emergency uh, planning. And so I'm here to learn and gather resources. So thank you. Welcome, Carrie. Uh, Lisa. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Samaro. I'm with Silicon Valley Independent Living Center in Santa Clara County. I'm an independent living skills coordinator. I also work on the DDAR program here. And Alyssa. Hello, everyone. My name is Alyssa. I'm at Tri County Independent Living in Humboldt County. And our emergency preparedness person is changing a lot and we don't have one that's going to be here for very long. Um, plus, you know, with everything that's going on in California, it's really important to be here and learn. So that's what I'm doing. I'm here to learn. Nice to meet you all. Great. I'm super excited to see some new faces and also some faces that I see a lot over in my systems chain work. So. Thank you all for being here and feel free to, this is, this meeting is open in terms of like it's, it is a collective kind of uh, conversation about action and, and next or uh, next steps and systems change. So feel free to, if you need something explained or there's something that you don't yet know about, don't hesitate to ask. Um, there's a lot to learn in, in all the work that we do. And I still am learning a lot about uh, DDAR myself. So um, fortunately I'm joined by uh, oh, June. Uh, June, would you like to do a quick intro? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm June Kale. So I'm a uh, in LA and uh, I just went contract work with California Foundation of Independent Living Center, CFILC, and uh, working collaboratively with Russell and organizing and facilitating the second Thursday of the month calls, the topic calls related to emergency issues. And our next call should be lots of fun. It's uh, going to be uh, kind of a, a group learning experience related to uh, what's in your go bags. And it'll be, a, we've done it before nationally. It's a great discussion. We learn tons from each other and we've got um, two judges. So there'll actually be some prizes for some of what's judged to be the most I don't know, creative answers in different, um, different subject areas. So just urge you to join us on August 12th at 10.30. So should be lots of fun. Sounds like lots of fun. I, I like games, so that's And, awesome. and Sydney is actually one of our esteemed judges. Thank you, Sydney. And June is clearly not one to brag, but she just literally wrapped up a uh, a workshop at the National Council on Independent Living uh, for the entire uh, NICL uh, or National Council on Independent Living is an, eight, uh, an organization that is much like ours except for the entire United States and had a really great, I think, national conversation about uh, disaster, um, disaster preparedness and, and our community. Um, so let's... Um, Let's dive right into the, the, the meat of what we wanted to discuss today um, based on the conversation that we had had previously was talking about battery use as, as backup devices and getting some community learned knowledge about how these batteries can be used and knowing that different devices, you know, it's a very complex situation. 
So um, I did share the um, document that June has put out. Um, it was, uh, this is the third edition and it was put out in March of 2019. I'm excited to hear that um, Sid and the team here is working on putting together a survey because I feel like the survey data can inform things like uh, an updated version. Um, but I'd love to hear maybe some of your reflections on particularly the, um, the, you know, the informational pieces, but also thinking about what are some of the stories that we're hearing um, unmet, you know, or, or, or even successful um, experiences that consumers or, or other community members are, are going through. So, um, you know, I know we're in the midst of, of wildfire season. Uh, not that I don't even know that that term applies anymore, but um, I'll open it up. Hey, Russell, can I just add June Kales here that um, in our discussion uh, and the reason we shared the article was it, it is in need of constant update, but the intent is to communicate to anyone with a disability who has a plan for alternative power, you know, in a very plain language kind of way. What, you know, what we need to think about, what we need to do, we have multiple items that need um, power. How do we plan for that? You know, I hear some of you talk about these Yeti batteries and frankly, I get confused sometimes. Can I just plug my scooter in as is, you know, what's it gonna take? Um, just how do we convert this to really lay plain language that people like me who don't have any electrical engineering, any of that background can really take away and use and make work in terms of my own emergency plan. Thanks, June. And our goal here is to have something that we can share. Go ahead. Is there That's something? Just... Oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Russell. This is Sid. And, um, you know, I think. I am sort of relatively new to this program, so I don't want to like speak over people who have um, actual experiences doing this kind of work for the last uh, two years. Um, but you know, I think recently on a call there was there was definitely some conversations about um, you know how long certain um, CPAP and BiPAP machines. Um, need to be utilized during the night and the different types of batteries that might um, better work for folks depending on the length of, of the usage of a medical device. Um, and also a discussion about, you know, refrigeration recently and, and, you know, what type of battery actually will provide the type of re refrigeration that people need. And so, you know, maybe in terms of developing a resource, and I think you know, CFILC and DDAR have been thinking about this definitely because we're hearing folks um, talking about these issues, obviously, um, you know, maybe developing like a basic chart where, um, you know, you we can like list the device and we can list, you know, if you're using it for such and such hours, this, this type of battery would be, you know, productive, something like that maybe. <clears throat> Bruce. Okay, so, um, you know, it's, uh, I originally, when I first started uh, with the battery uh, part of the program, I tried to put together a list of items and how long they would run for. Um, one of the things that I found out very quickly was 
it really depends on the manufacturer and when you boil it all down um it really depends on how many watts the thing is pulling to decide how long any particular piece of equipment will run so for example uh there's a whole gambit of CPAP machines. Now there are ones that are designed specifically for travel that will run for four nights on one of the 1500 batteries. Uh, there are other ones that are big, you know, units with heating humidifiers and that where you might get two nights, but it's going to be stretching it and you better hope that they're two short nights. Um, refrigerators surprisingly um, last a lot longer than you would think because they cycle on and off as the temperature changes and it, it depends on the outside temperature or your house temperature and it depends on how big the refrigerator is so really everybody's independent need is so specific to them and their equipment um, it's really hard to tell. One of the things that you can do is you can, in fact, now let me grab it real quick. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, I think that the, um, the complexity of the conversation, especially whenever it comes to you can battery do. power, you know, um, and, and electric use in general. Um, um, oh, thanks. I'm going to have to turn my um, my background off to show this <laughs> because it will cut it out if I don't. But this gizmo here will tell you, I'm holding it upside down, it's called a kilowatt. And it will tell you how many watts, whatever things that you want to plug into it are pulling. So like if you want to find out whether somebody can run a mini fridge, which for people who have medication issues, you can get one of these things. It's just a small, well, basically hold a six pack of soda is all hold, but this little thing here will pull a lot less wattage and keep medication cold than a big giant fridge. Whereas your food's important. Yeah. But your medication at some point might be a little bit, a little bit more important. And if it doesn't take up the whole thing, of course you can put other stuff in it, but you kind of have to tailor what the, you know, for what kind of machinery that they're using. No battery in the world will run one of those big oxygen concentrators, which are like two feet high and 10 or 12 inches wide um, for very long at all. If you get four hours out of it, I'd be surprised. So even that's with the big Yeti 3000s. So it really depends on how many watts you're pulling. It's all math, <laughs> which nobody likes. Hey, Bruce, <clears throat> I'm math impaired. Junior, <laughs> I don't do the math very well, but um, what, when you say how many watts the device is pulling, um, if I don't have one of those devices you just shared to um, determine wattage, and most people don't, um, how do we begin to think about this? Where, how do we know, how do we know how to plan for this. I, and I think that your, what you just said about a mini fridge is really critical. People need to know this. And if they can't afford one, maybe their health plan would pay for it. What's it cost? I think that's a great idea. Or and even maybe a mini, um, you know those coolers that have USB connectors? Um, maybe, that's the kind of stuff I think we need to provide, help people think about that they may not have thought of themselves. You're on mute. You're on mute. Even though um, 
it's very small, like on some things like this cell phone charger, okay, which will never come into view because it's such tiny lettering. It probably never focused, but um, all electrical appliances are required by law to list what their wattage is on on the machine like even this uh even this little you know pencil sharpener has it on the bottom how many watts the thing uses when it's running so it, you know it's a, it's a matter of you know we've got a 3000 amp hour battery and you have how many watts and how many volts which most of your house current stuff that you just the regular two prong thing that you plug in. Okay. These are all, they all run between 110, 125 Watts most of the time. Um, I'm sorry, not Watts, but volts, excuse me. Uh, 110, 125 volts, uh, which is that's typical American house current. Some big appliances are going to take higher current, but you're not really going to run anything uh, more than our general house current from one of these Yeti batteries. It's just not possible. So, um, you know, it's, it's just a matter, like I said, it, it, like I said, it boils down to the individual. Now, one of the cool things about the Yeti batteries is if you have a piece of equipment that you plug into it, it will analyze what the draw from that piece of equipment is. And it'll tell you how many hours it will run using that same draw. So if I want, say I take a battery out to somebody and I plug in their CPAP machine and I plug in the mini fridge and I turn everything on, within a few minutes, it's going to give me some kind of a reading as to how many hours those two appliances will run nonstop before the battery is out of power. So it is one of the handy things about those Yeti batteries that, you know, it just gives you basically starts a little countdown timer. So to give you some idea now, is that a hundred percent correct? I wouldn't count on it, but it'll give you an idea. Anyway. Okay. I'm done. <laughs> Thanks Bruce. I see uh, Marcus has his hand up. Uh, yeah, I did. Bruce just touched on exactly what I wanted to talk about, which was that display on, on the Yeti batteries. And I was actually curious to see um, how it matches up. Uh, I haven't done any particular tests here in, in my facility to see if the draw is the same or the battery lasts the same amount of time as it says it's going to gonna do it. And uh, so, you know, to touch on what June says, I, I, you know, at the bare minimum, you have that, um, that display on the battery that will give you a general reading about how long it's going to last. Um, and then I would also like to confirm, you know, what Bruce said, uh, I see it, it depends entirely on the, on the equipment that's plugged into it as, as far as how they're going to last. And like you said, namely the manufacturer and uh, the type of uh, equipment that it is. O2 concentrators, for example, draw an amazing amount of power. And so, um, you know, uh, even to the point where uh, the Yetis are, in, are inadequate, you know, for that type of uh, medical equipment for a prolonged um, power outage. So, but yeah, that's well, what. Marcus and, and Bruce, just to slow you down, because I want to. I wanted to just emphasize that, you know, who are, who are, who are our audience is. So I listen to Bruce. I turn the fan upside down on my desk. Let's suppose I mean, this was some kind of equipment I really needed for whatever. So is it, is it the VAC? Is it that hurts? I mean, or do I just ignore this? I mean, you know, you said, Everything has it posted on the bottom, but you know, I don't know what to look at. Is it, is it VAC? Is it something 0.24A? Is it 60HZ? What am I looking at here? Well, you know, I, I think the best way that we're going to get 
that information is speaking with our consumers that have already been issued their batteries and assessing what type of medical equipment they have and comparing it. I mean, I, I agree with you, but I'm just trying to help us think also broadly that um, your people only represent a tiny fraction of the, the audience that we need to reach. So just to think broadly about this. So. I think, you know, just listening to the conversation here, there's a couple things that are coming, you know, kind of in my mind in terms of talking about what information do we want to put out. I think that the, you know, knowing that we do have that function of the, of the Yeti batteries, uh, you know, that do give the time left um, and testing it uh, to uh, uh, Marcus's, you know, point is really, I think, important. It's also important, of course, to know that, that the devices draw different amounts of power at different times. And sometimes that can be really hard to kind of know or measure like a, a wheelchair charger, I believe charges heavy at the front. And then it kind of slowly kind of puts into a, what they call a trickle, at least from what I've been told about uh, battery chargers for a, for a power chair or scooter mobility device. Um, but the opposite may well be true for something like a um, uh, CPAP or a BiPAP machine where they start off maybe at a lower use and scale up. So I'm curious as to how the Yetis kind of maybe work, if they do anything to try to judge that or, you know, I would think it might be tricky for the bat for that battery to do that, but I'm curious as to actual experiences and people tried, you know, some of the, the more common um, items and found them to be fairly accurate or is it off by quite a bit? This is Lauren from the Independent Living Resource Center. So something that I tell all my consumers is, you know, you might share um, equipment with somebody that's tested their battery before, but maybe you use it more or differently, or you, you know, maybe you're, you breathe deeply or you sleep 10 hours. So, you know, no matter what, test it and see how long it lasts you. And then for people that have high, high draw, you know, power items like oxygen concentrators in power wheelchairs, um, I inform them that it's a band aid and will get you to a hotel or hospital. Um, but not to, you know, for high draw or even multiple medium to large size items to not depend on the battery, but to use it in order to evacuate. That's, that's really, I think, important and a good way of stating that. Um, is anyone who is working directly with consumers now, are you other than having, of course, a one-on-one -on -one conversation, um, are there any materials that you're using to kind of give folks a lay of the, you know, kind of know what a, you know, what the capabilities of the battery are? Is there any baseline information that you're giving out? Because I think um, one of the really powerful things is if we if we all feel like there is at least this statement that we can say about battery backup. Um, then it would be really powerful to get it out to make sure it gets to everyone. And to June's, you know, June's point, the, the thing we talked about last meeting was how to use that information to then push to get the information in the hands of everyone that would receive a piece of DME that might need, you know, a battery ba um, solution. Hi, this is Megan with pg and &E, and I, I have one um, comment to add there about communication to consumers or just in general to customers about battery usage, and that would be to make sure that they understand that these batteries are really just for their critical medical devices and not for their 
like computers or lights or like, you know, a bunch of other, you know, the refrigerator, et cetera. Cause I know last year we had a, some issues with people draining their batteries much quicker than they likely should have with the equipment that was, um, you know, supposed to be used with the battery. So I think we just have to be really clear with people on expectations of what these batteries can do. And they're, they're very limited, obviously. And so we try to size them to the right, to the equipment that they have and, and be very, um, um, you know, careful and, and make sure that we're serving their needs. But I just, that was such a problem last year. So I think just really clear communication on their limitations. Hey, Megan, June, I think that's a really important point. And uh, that's why I want to go back to Bruce. Um, I don't think people even know how to think about this. Like Bruce's flash of whatever that refrigerator thing was. And there actually is a um, question for you, Bruce, in chat about can you provide more info on the device, which shows you how many watts a connected device is using, but also more on that mini fridge. I mean, what is that? How much is it? Where do you get something like that? The mini fridge uh, was about $50. Got it on Amazon. Um, like I said, it'll hold about a six pack of soda, um, which is not very much, but it's big enough uh, to hold most people's medication. I'm going to say the majority, but obviously not everybody. You know, if you're using large IVs and that sort of thing, there's no way. But um, <clears throat> the advantage to small refrigerator units or any refrigerator unit, um, they cycle on and off and they only use power when they need power. So for example, uh, we had a dorm refrigerator I call it a dorm refrigerator because it's about two feet by two feet and it's very common, uh, much bigger than the one I showed you. Um, very common for students to get in their dorm rooms, you know, it holds some a decent amount of stuff. I think they're about 2.2 cubic feet. Um, I had one of those on a Yeti 3000 battery and it ran it for over three days. So three 24 hour periods. So it's a matter of, the size of the refrigerator, you know, how much stuff is in the refrigerator. Uh, actually, a, a fully loaded refrigerator that's loaded with a lot of liquids and things um, that automatic that, that all of a sudden gets its power shut off will actually stay cooler longer than an empty refrigerator because mm. the other stuff in there actually helps keep it cold, kind of like ice in a, in a freezer. Um, and you know, I, I do teach people that if you are getting down to the wire and, you know, it, it's your choice to keep your medication cold or to keep your CPAP or oxygen concentrator going, obviously you're going to unplug the refrigerator. And when the refrigerator gets below refrigerator temperature, right. And your freezer is to refrigerator temperature because it's slowly melting things you move your medication from your refrigerator into your freezer. And that way you can keep your medication longer if you don't have any way to keep your refrigerator powered. Um, the use of these things, I try to explain to people, this is, you're using this as a last resort. This is an emergency. Anytime you lose power and you're required to have it for your medical devices, uh, you need to understand that you could be out today, but you could also be out three days. So if you plug in the TV and the, the router and the DVD player, or the Roku, you're actually, you know, losing time on your medical devices. So, you know, that's your choice. You know, people are going to do what they do. Um, I know one of my consumers told me that they did use their tv uh, yeah. you know that's uh, up to them but uh, i also had uh, a battery that was dropped off by another power company not pg e just so you know um with absolutely no instruction and on how to use it or even how to turn it on and i ended up over there 
uh, at their house trying to show them how to turn it on. So um, yeah, good instruction on when we drop the batteries off definitely needs to happen. And I'm sure everybody that we're, you know, we're working with does, you know, everybody in this, in this chat is not going to just drop something off, but people do. And so they just need a little, little help. Bruce June, uh, I like what you said about um, good instructions. You know, I, I think we take for granted that people know how to think about this, that they, and they don't, you know, just the fact that we have to, I think we have to help people to think about what are their priorities and to say things that seem obvious to us, but may not be to them. Running your TV may not be a priority if you have a radio. You know, putting your medication eventually in the freezer. I mean, I never would have thought of that in a million years. You know, when do I do that? When do I think about doing that? Do I need a thermometer for my refrigerator so that I know when it gets to be a dangerous, too high to be safe? You know, people. We think about this a lot, but even me, I mean, I'm learning a lot from what you're saying. I don't know this stuff. People don't know this stuff. They don't know how to think about it. This is Sid. I think that's and, the... Oops, sorry, Russell. Go ahead. Go ahead, Sid. Oh, no, I was just going to um, say, and, and folks on this call pretty much know um, that CFILC and the DDAR program is planning um, soon to come up with um, a resource list for um, refrigeration. And I think, I think this call is definitely informing just kind of like separating out, out the list for, you know, just making it clear that some, dev some devices will be, will need to be plugged into the batteries and some devices will, you know, not, will be able to sort of be self-cooling items um, and and sort of um, providing examples of um, maybe not just like the length of time that the refrigeration could be used on, on a battery if that's the case, but also, you know, different examples of what, what could be cooled in these devices. It's great to hear that there's gonna be a training specifically on reg for refrigeration as I hear that that is definitely kind of a, a, a thing that's popped up very recently. There's a lot of interest in that. Um, uh, Marcus, do you have, is your hand um, up? Yeah, I put it up. I don't mean to uh, beat the same death to, the same point to death here. Uh, we all touched about it uh, a couple of times, but I, I did want to go back to uh, what Megan and Lauren and then Bruce and then June talked about um, in terms of expectations of the DDAR program. I think one of the one of the most common words um, that I get that's incorrect in applications is that it's a backup battery generator, right? <laughs> and so people, I, I think that it's important that people understand what they're getting. And I, I don't know that necessarily they, they do. They think that they, yeah, they can plug their TV into it and, and charge their phones. And it's not intended for that. I think Lauren, uh, was it Megan or Lauren that said, it's, you know, this is kind of a last minute thing in order to enable you to get out and uh, you know take care of what you need to do. Um, a lot of my customers just, or consumers, excuse me, just want a battery and they just want it to sit there in their house for as long as they need it. And that's just not practical for us. So anyway, that's all. Hey Marcus, can I just clarify Junior, when you said plug in their phone, I mean, to me, my phone is a lifeline. So why wouldn't I plug in my phone if I had to? Well, of course, that's what it's there for. But at the same time, I, I just meant to illustrate the point that they look at it as a general at-home charger. Okay. You know, Got it. It's just there for them to use for whatever purpose they want. You know, yeah. Yeah. you could just as likely roll it down to the beach and plug in your, your speakers. <laughs> Good point. And I, I, I think, Marcus, you've hit on something. I'm, I'm curious, just a, a poll of folks um, 
that I feel like is a baseline. I think it covers so many things. Like, I, I mean, I hate to start off education with a negative, but um, are there any that, that disagree that that's something that's really valuable is that it's not a generator? And Lauren, see your hand is up. I'm not raising my hand to um, disagree with that, just that I have had to explain to consumers in the past, you know, I know you would love to use it for your CCTV or for your laptop or for something else that you, you know, is critical for your everyday needs and for your emergency preparedness. But, you know, unfortunately, this is, this is for your life-saving equipment um, pretty much strictly. And so, you know, for those individuals that have experienced um, multiple power shutoffs, you know, we encourage or see if they're eligible that we can provide possibly a solar powered lantern for them to recharge their phone with. So, you know, we, we encourage as much as possible to use other avenues to keep those things charged up. So that way the battery is strictly for the life-saving equipment. Thank you. Thanks. And I'm, a, uh, I'm thinking that probably proved very useful to avoid a lot of a lot of potential situations. Hey, Lauren, so. June, um, in talking to Christina and CFILC and others, we have a hard time sometimes distinguishing between life saving and life sustaining. My scooter is not going to save my life, I don't think, unless it's an evacuation device, then it will. So, um, you know, sometimes I obsess about words in turn, so excuse me, but I think um, in the way we teach people to prioritize, sometimes it's just life sustaining because my iPod may kid, my iPad maybe the way I communicate with people or my iPhone is a lifeline. Um, so even that, I think we have to be careful and clear and define our terms because I'm tripping over these terms all the time. Right, you're, you're certainly right, June, and I'd agree with you. And that's why, you know, we, we do advocate for, you know, what your life-saving equipment would be, um, could also be sustaining. So for someone with uh, an intellectual disability that needs their iPad in order for their safety to be continued, you know, that would be their life-saving piece of equipment. Or if you need your power scooter in order to evacuate, you know, that would be your um, life-saving piece of equipment. So maybe I'm conflating um, sustaining with saving here, but you know that is what I mean. And I do most of this on a case by case basis. So you know, if someone needs their iPad or their tablet to communicate, then that would be their essential piece of equipment that they would need um, to keep charged and to take with them if they need to go to a shelter or you know if they needed to communicate at home that we would want them to keep that equipment um, in a working condition. Uh, could I jump in for just a second? I'd like to kind of add on to that. Um, I do think that, you know, having a phone certainly could be your lifeline in a lot of cases. And, you know, in the emergency workshops, we talk about the uh, importance of staying connected and staying, um, you know, informed. So, you know, using a battery to charge your TV in that, in an instance where you don't really need it, but if you're in an emergency situation, you might have to evac, then that TV becomes uh, an essential item that probably should be powered so that you can be informed as to when you need to evacuate. This is Bruce. I agree fully with that. So it switches from non-essential to essential in, you know, potentially when that you're 
in that emergency situation. So you have to, I guess you have to clarify to that individual, if there's an emergency declared, then that TV does become an essential lifeline or informational uh, tool that you might need to plug in. Hi, this is Megan again. I, I, say, I, I totally agree with that statement, I think, but we still need to make sure that the person was educated that, you know, if you, you know, if and when you do need to turn the TV on, certainly turn it on to get emergency, you know, responder information and, and updates on the emergency, but that it is going to impact your other medical equipment. So please do it sparingly. I guess we just, we still need to make sure that that message gets through that, you know, any, any other, any other appliances that are used are going to take away from your ability to use your other medical equipment. So again, it's just definitely, I, I feel like the, the education piece is so critical to, to all of this. Yeah. I, I, any ILC that gives out a battery should also, you know, supplement a emergency plan that would include ways of obtaining that information, uh, you know, should you need it. Uh, not just from the TV, but you may have backups through radio, uh, uh, ham, ham radio, I mean, whatever it might be. Uh, um, th those should be augmented, aug augmented with uh, our program. And I think affordability is a huge issue here, June. I think. Um, you know, maybe we need to consider over time, Megan, that we think about some other life, some other essential devices that are very low cost that kind of go with the battery. For example, the mini fridge or the, what's it called? The lantern, the lantern aid. That's very inexpensive. Marcus is getting it. And we'll power your um, your phone and not use the battery. Because um, I don't think, I just learned about this from, from you all. I had no idea this existed. And um, it's a solar powered thing that I guess will power my phone for how long, Marcus? Um. Uh, well, we have solar powered chargers that we include in our emergency kits, which will um, charge two uh, smartphones to full capacity off of one charge. What and do then, those look like? Um, and how much are those? Let me get one. I'll show you. And do you give them away or do people have to buy them? No, we give them away. Okay. We give them in our emergency kits. So anyone that um, attends one of our, our presentations, our emergency preparedness presentations, Right. is eligible to receive one of these kits if they become one of our consumers. And so this is the particular uh, solar charger that we give away here. Um, you can see it's just a solar panel on the front and it has a flashlight as well. On the other end, you have a uh, charging port for two phones and in the middle there, this is a charging port for the wall. So you don't need, you can, you know, you can charge it off a plug if you want to. And it has a compass too, if anybody wants a compass, but you know, so they work, they work really, really well. Uh, I, I keep several, several of them around and I don't have to worry about charging. So and what, what's the time for the solar charge? How long can it take? Um, you know, I just kind of keep, I, I literally just kind of keep one on my dashboard in the car and I keep one in a sunny spot in my office. So I haven't actually um, timed it to see how long it takes to charge, but it will charge continuously while the unit is charging itself. So you can just put it out in the sun and the thing will charge your phone. So as long as you have light, you're good to go. And oh, and it, it, if you were asking this, I mean, in order to charge uh, uh, your phone, it's. It's not fast, you know, it'd probably take a little, over an hour, you know, on a slow charge, but it'll, it, it does get there. So. But what I'm asking is if there's a long term power outage and I've already drained it because I charged my phone, but I want to re energize it through the solar charge, how long will it take 
for me to place it in the sun for it to get enough power for me to recharge my cell phone. Well, it will charge as long as it is in the sun. So, you know, if it was completely drained, it might need a couple minutes just to, you know, reestablish the, the battery life or whatever in, in the product. But then it will start charging your phone immediately as long as you have it plugged in in the sun. Oh. And then, uh, so this is this is made by Power Power Bank. And uh, and you know I know that our my director got a pretty good deal on these. I've got a whole shelf full full of them, and we didn't pay very much per um, per unit. But it's worth doing a little um, extra research on this because we bought these about a year, close to a year and a half ago. And in that amount of time, I'm sure that there's probably a more efficient product out there that's roughly the same price. But these, for what they're, you know, for what we paid for them, for what we want them to do, they're more than, more than adequate, so. So I have this. There you go. Oh, it's the it's the same device, I believe, Jim. No, well, it says very similar. Tough tested, and my point is that um, oh, yeah. it I got it on Amazon, I think, but it didn't tell me a whole lot. And one of the directions said. Don't sell or charge it unless you have to. And that confused me. Why is that? Yeah. So, you know, when you try to buy these things, you know, even the way they're promoted and described, like on Amazon, frankly, for me, you know, I've got to give myself some credit. It's freaking confusing. <laughs> yeah. I think the one thing that's really helpful is hearing from folks to hear what they're doing, you know, to help educate folks now. Um, and, and it's interesting that here we are at 1130. And the one thing that we've come up in common is the batteries are not generators. And so, you know, I mean, we do want to be very careful in not uh, over promising and, you know, and, I think with solar devices, they carry the, you know, it's the same, it's the same thing as the, you know, using a, a, a battery, right? It, it pulls, charging it works, you know, kind of at a different rate every time. So to say it charges in this amount of time kind of depends probably on a lot of things, including probably how much sun um, and where you are. So I don't, I, I think the the inclusion to June your your inclusion about the um what did that device that you had the battery that you have what did it say? It said um, don't use a solar charger unless you have to. Right. So what they're what they're recommending, at least in my like thinking, is that they're trying to say every every type of battery, including a solar charged battery only is good for so many charges. Oh. And so they're trying to recommend people don't use this for your everyday, like day-to-day -day commute when you're, you know, if, if this is something that you're relying on, right? Um, but yeah, so I don't know. It's an interesting way of stating it though. I'm surprised that they didn't say if using this as, a, as an emergency device, don't use it every day. Because honestly, I mean, otherwise, I don't know how much it costs, June, but so this is kind of a conversation that people should have with consumers. If it's a cheap device, if it's a low cost solar battery thing and it does what it needs to do, use it to, you know, to, to for your iPad if you want, especially if it's something that's going to get you, you know, through the moment. But you do need to think about it like how many of these things, you know, solar charging will be available all the time but, or hopefully, um, but, uh, you know, while electricity, you know, the, the um, being able to charge them traditionally is maybe not available in the emergency situation. So. You make a really good point, Russell. I never, well, thought, I never thought of the fact that 
you know, it'll only charge by sun for so many times. It never occurred to me. <laughs> yeah. It was weird that they didn't add that, like, why they were saying it. Mm -hmm. Here, here's a little point Russell got me thinking about in terms of um, battery length. Um, the Yeti batteries are designed to be plugged in 24 seven, mm -hmm. right? So they maintain a charge. However, they are recommended to be cycled from time to time, meaning that you drop the charge on it, like you, you run down the charge on them and you charge them back up in terms of maintenance. So, you know, if we're gonna, if we're gonna leave a, a battery at someone's house for a particular, particular amount of time, you know, maybe plugging your uh, your smart TV into it isn't such a bad idea from time, you know, from every once in a while, but, so. You know, Marcus, you and your sort of tell you that uh, I think that's critical. I am, um, after 30 years of using a scooter, I finally bought a second one because I was sick of being stranded. And um, I just assumed that the first one would charge like the second one charged which is just always keeping it plugged in. Well, it wasn't the case. It'll ruin the battery very early. So mm -hmm. your point about, you know, recycling or draining, you know, you might know that, but if you're delivering a battery to me, I need to know what that means. Mm -hmm. You know, um, how often do I need to do that? Because I don't have a clue. Yeah. It could also be problematic because um, a, a full charge on a Yeti 3000 takes off the wall of, you know, at least 24 hours. And so if you have that battery drained and it's in your house and that's the particular time that you get the PSPS shut off. Ugh. So, you know, that might be something that we should um, consider. And, you know, if you have a battery at someone's house for a particular amount of time, we change it out from time to time i don't know but anyway yeah bruce you've got more experience. so well one of the things that i've noticed even with my yeti batteries that i've that i leave plugged in here that i'm getting low on them now but um that i've left plugged in is after a while meaning a couple months they drop to like 98 percent mm -hmm. and you're like why why is that they you know, it hasn't gone anywhere. It hasn't done anything. So what I do is I unplug them and I have this old fan that sits in the corner that don't use anymore. Uh, but I found that if I just plug that thing in and let it run for an hour and just use some of the power off of the battery and then plug it back in, it'll charge back up to a hundred percent. So I just let it run a fan for an hour. So you, you don't have to run it all the way down. Green, you just run it down a bit. And then... Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but how did you all figure this out? I mean, you know, you're you got great information, but those of us who don't think that way, I mean, these are the kind of things you need to translate for all the people out there. I just took a wild guess. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I would never think to do that. Uh, but, I'll try this. <laughs> yeah, I just you know not don't think about battery back up frequently enough to even think like that. So uh, Alexandra shared in chat, consider other audiences for lack of access to power. Many products like the Luminade solar powered lantern are targeted to backcountry use. You can get actual product reviews from the backcountry community. I have been disappointed when actually using some of these devices when I am off the grid and or in the back country. Yes, and, and I think, uh, go ahead, Alexander, would you like to let her? Uh, yes, I think I'm off mute. Um, a, a lot of these products, I mean, I like the idea of like running the fan because um, you, know, you think you've got something that's going to really provide your backup and it doesn't. I mean, the, some of the solar charging that I've used um, and the, believe me, I'm in some unusual situations. Like I take my Kindle um, into the backcountry snow camping and then have a charger for it. Um, and even when I'm not in such extreme um, conditions, 
um, just at, off the grid. It's like, it'll charge the, the solar charger like the one June held up. I mean, it, it charges nicely the first time and maybe it'll do it again, but after a bit, it doesn't use it. And since many backcountry users are going in for, um, you know, a week, two weeks, um, it needs to have some longevity to it. And um, the longevity could translate for the audience you're talking about into um, additional devices used. Because um, if you've got more than one device that you've got to charge, like your laptop, your cell phone, et cetera, it's like you don't get too many charges off of them. And I think it's really important. And I know June does actually test out her stuff to see how long it takes and um, does it work? But I think it's important to do that and to see how many times it will do it before it just won't. And then there's, there's you know, with any of these, the one June has and I have, it's like, it's actually possible to um, make it work backwards. So instead of the charger charging your phone, the charger is taking power from the phone. Um, and right. it's like showing folks exactly where the plugs need to go, the USB cables and how they need to go out. Again, that's another June type question, but um, if you, it is possible to do them backwards and lose all the charge in your, for example, phone or laptop. Um, so I think that I put a note in before. It's like have 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 you folks like worked with IEEE? You know the, the technology folks. It's like I've run across them at disasters where they have like a a van that goes out and gives out little solar chargers and helps people with the thing. I think that this that what California is doing right. is so important and so intriguing that I bet some part of IEEE that's already working on disaster and emergency management um, and the consumer interface would be fascinated to um, assist with, with what you're doing because it's so important. Um, and you're so far along, you're perfect group for this. It's like um, getting the right contacts in IEEE and having them do a very interesting consumer product that would do all these answer June's questions. It's like they should all answer June's questions. Um, then it'll work for the rest of us too. So um, I think it'd be worth looking into. But the backcountry community is a good place for real time tested products. And they don't particularly like the Luminade um, Lantern. Um, they, and so I didn't buy one because I thought, oh, this is a great idea. I'm going to buy one. And then I didn't because it did not get great reviews, but it is another place to get real time, actual user experience in um, off the grid. Can you share the links with us, Alex, that um, where we go for that kind of info? Well, REI is actually a good place to get to get the reviews, but um, I, I get them out of Backpacker magazine. I've gotten them out of any place that is doing backcountry, um, sells backcountry products and their kind of uh, community boards. But um, I think the review on the Luminade where I decided not to get it was, uh, was from REI where they compared the products. But I think that that's just one place where you're off the grid. There, there's probably others, the prepper communities are certainly into it, but to get real experience <sighs> Um, people actually using them, I think, is is important. I mean, not everybody can have Bruce Morgan in their back pocket or or Marcus. It's like it'd be great, but you know, like maybe they could do the reviews too. I'm glad that CFILC is going to do the one on refrigeration. I have it in my notes. We're going to look that up. Thank you. You know your point, Alex, about um. If I was you doing one on refrigeration, maybe that's what we need to think about, you know, going very, very um, specific in some of this stuff so people can read what they need. Um, you know, your whole point about, you know, backward charging, like 
I can understand that one better, but, you know, using these solar power devices, you know, what, how do we get the most out of it possible? I don't even remember how old this is or when or, you know, but I know that when I charge it through the plug, the charge on this last many months, I'm amazed. I, I agree. And the NOCO chargers, you know, that um, we've been playing with, um, I uh, charging them up at home um, when you've got power supply, I mean, that's needed um, more frequently than the product literature will tell you. I'm always reluctant about the times in the product literature. Um, I, I mean, I always like your approach, June, that you actually try them and see how long it's going to take because I've gotten to the point where I no longer um, trust the optimum times in these, in these, uh, uh, in, in the product literature. You want real world experience with these. Yeah, good point. And uh, you all just take a look at Amazon because that's where most of us late people go for this stuff. And look at how bad the descriptions are. You can never, it's like comparing apples to oranges. They all use different terms. None of them have the same measurement. It's like Greek. Unfortunately, uh, I think the, the level of Greek gets exponentially more complicated too. The more, the more you go down the rabbit hole, the more it gets, you know, really complicated. I think people think of people think of electricity like they do water, right? It comes out of the thing when I turn on the thing, and it's it, it's not that simple. Good point. And, and really, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Russell, I keep doing that to you. Um, I was gonna say, uh, I think this, this has been a great reminder that in putting the resources together, especially in the refrigeration context, um, you know, looking at the reviews is a good idea. Um, and that's something that I will definitely spend some time doing. And I think also like June and Alexandra were saying, you know, maybe, um, not just looking on Amazon, but um, some of these other resources, especially for people who are camping and people who are, um, you know, deliberately trying to be off the grid. I mean, they, you guys have provided some really great ideas. So I just want to say thank you for that. And moreover, this has me thinking, is there an overlap between our community and those who are living off grid, um, in, in lieu of the, the, the phrase backcountry, I, I think I'll use off the grid, but um, it's, all, it's all kind of the, the same idea, right? There have been folks who have prepared or thought more deeply about living without access like, you, like we often do. So I think thinking deeply about that and how to make the meaningful connections, right? How to actually share what it means to to train and and to to talk, you know, have conversations. So that's actually a great idea. I think that having some of those folks, you know, kind of in our sites as folks we want to connect with is is really smart. Also, I would encourage, even though it's going to be a complex conversation, um, there are organizations of of electrical engineers, you know, that can provide some some probably way to Greek explanation, but, but we need to, you know, say we would love to, you, you know, your partnership in, in assessing what we're, what we're working on. Right. So and those are all, these are all great. I think communities and kind of Venn diagrams that we want to intersect more than they do already. And I would just add, Russell, that I think our conversations here are priceless because most people, when you try and have this conversation with them, they look at you like, go away, don't bother me. But 
I love how this group can go deep and really understand how critical this is to, to get a handle on. Great. All right, we are down to our last 10 minutes. So I wanted to kind of take the time. Um, we've had some new folks and um, we, we have made some technical changes to how we set up this meeting. So my apologies in advance if some of our things are not quite as, quite as smooth as we had hoped, but they will be uh, becoming more, more fluid for the next time. Um, Shana, just a quick, a quick check-in with you is um, I know that previously we had had a poll. Um, I don't know if there's the ability to, to do that at all in this um, currently before we exit the meeting or is the, does that have to be set up in advance? Hi, Russell, that's a great question. Today, we will not have a poll. Okay. Next month's meeting, we will have our poll. Great, thank you. You're so I, I want to add, you know, um, the next poll too. I would like to make sure that we add this question. So I'll do it verbally this time and we'll kind of feel out for how it goes. Um, for our next systems change call, what piece of this particular conversation do we want to go deeper into? Because I've heard several and I do want to maybe try to avoid moving away from batteries altogether, but any any piece of that, like what part of this conversation do we feel like we could actually work toward? I still loved the idea that I think that the most impactful thing we can do is find a way to have something available for people who receive DME to get some sort of informational notice, you know, about this, these are things you want to think about when you are receiving this power chair there's a power outage so but I'm curious to what other that's a huge even that's a huge huge yeah. thing so. any thoughts or Russell can I um add um okay so I love what you just said um, and I, I've been loving what I've heard throughout this whole conversation. I've learned a lot. Um, for the DME part, what um, it should include something like, um, well, for me, I, I was just looking last night for um, um, something for my power chair because we've been having power outages over here a lot lately. Um, and I actually had looked up the Yeti. I, I didn't know um, that was a, a popular one. I, I saw it on Amazon and I was considering this might be an option for us because we have two power wheelchairs in, in my family. So the thing is, uh, and what, was, what June was saying is that it's all Greek. So if we can get um, DME providers, when they um, provide us a power wheelchair or any other device, it would be so helpful if they could give us a list of, of options for alternative recharging. Um, even the names, um, you know, the specifics, because it is Greek to us. When we're looking, we have no idea. You can say, well, you need to think about how are you gonna charge it when you have no power for a few days? Um, okay, so that's fine to tell me that. It's, I kind of know that, but I need names of the solutions. I need it so that I can go find these items. So I can be prepared because if you start talking the watts and all that, I'm not gonna know. So they need to supply us with names of the solutions, all, uh, price, of the solutions because as you know, a lot of us are limited on our income. And um, you know, that would be such a good start for us. Thanks, Carrie. Yeah, I think it's really that baseline knowledge and kind of getting to the essence of what is that? Like, for example, I would think, well, we want them to know that 
uh, you know, in California again, that there is, you know, the DDAR program. Um, so really, honestly, uh, you know, June, June and I both said that I think that we um, would all hope that the DME providers would just do this of their own good, but we probably know that the state is probably going to have to get involved. So therefore we could target, you know, California as kind of a test. Exactly, I, and I just want to plant the seed from the workshop I just did. The last thing I said was, we have to advocate that the state and federal government insist, require vendors to do carry what you just said. Because until that's a requirement, a regulation, a standard, it's not gonna get done the way we want it to. And also we need to as consumers, as advocates, advocate with our health plan people to help us pay for whatever those connectors are that we need or whatever you call them so that I can charge the scooter off the car battery if all else fails, whatever. You know, we've got to put this into a standard, a regulation, part of our systemic advocacy agenda. I agree. Thank you, June. There's also some really great uh, discussion in the chat. Um, again, there are multiple names for folks who live or or know that they um, you know are choosing to live in a situation that they may have more limited access to. Um, including those who use uh, RVs or recreational vehicles regularly and, and so many others. Um, so I do think that building some of those connections is, is important because those folks have a lot of experience just with real world, uh, what to think about, how to plan. And so, thank you. Um, Russell, quick yeah. question. Um, would this group, like to have a shared document that they can take all the ideas, tips, stories, everything that we've heard today and put in this document. And it's not an overnight thing, Russell, it takes a lot of time, but start building some type of infographic charts that you could share with consumers at some point and pull it all together to educate them. We have a uh, shared um, file already for some of the Southern California um, ILCs uh, that we all share that's intended to have that type of information in it so everybody can draw from it. Um, I'm happy to share that with you. And Great. There's not that much in it right now, but I, I think that it's a great thing, great resource. Yes. That would actually be really helpful. Um, the thing I would maybe... Uh, you know, rush us to, or the kind of, to think about is for now, this would be like, we, we wanna keep these kinds of conversations as internal as possible because right now consumers are, are you know, at different stages in their education process too. So um, while I'm, you know, very, very eager to let information out into the world, we just have to be careful that whenever we're giving like, you should expect this from this, you know, that we're just, we're not getting ourselves into trouble. And so that's the, that's the real thing. The answer to your, to your question though, Shane, I think is absolutely, we should start at least a, a collective like repository where we're, where we're putting together all of what we're learning and exploring together. And, and Sid, I'm looking forward to working more deeply with you too on how this, does you know nicely fit along with and also lifts up the work we're already doing and i agree with you russell that you have to be careful what information you share with consumers you have to make sure it's sewed up tight before you give it to them lest it be misconstrued and come back on us total agreement but in terms of organizing our, our uh, discussions here absolutely having a uh, perhaps um and maybe we can have that conference we'll We'll discuss with all of you um, through email and other other communication. We can figure out what maybe is most comfortable for you for for sharing. Um, you know, if it's Google Drive or something similar. So, I put my email in the uh, in the chat there. 
So um, thank, thank you. Thank you. Who wants that information? I'll, I'll forward it. Just, just shoot me. We are at 12 o'clock. Thank you all for sticking around and being a part of this conversation. There are so many nuances. I think that again, uh, June, you know, it's uh, Greek, I think is, is again, kind of putting it lightly. There's so many, whenever you talk about power uh, and power use, it's just, it's infinite number of doors you can go in. And, and I'm curious to see where refrigeration goes because you're adding an extra layer. I'm, uh, engineering adjacent enough to know that that not only do you have the physics of power, uh, electric power use, but you also have thermodynamics too. So that's going to be really, really <laughs> fascinating to kind of think and learn about. What does that think do and see see think and do whatever that was for second grade? Third, first grade. <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely right well thank you all again for being here and um, feel free to um, correspond with me my email address is russell r-u-s-s-e-l-l -L, at c-f-i-l-c dot org and um, I am open to any of your ideas and suggestions for future uh, future avenues for discussion but I'm looking forward to continuing this um, next month. So I will see you all here on the fourth uh, Thursday of August, which is the... Oops. It's the 26th. 26th, correct.